Thank you so much, and thank you for hanging in there uh, after all this time. So let me continue on the theme where we just left off with questions. And let me, um, let me ask you a question. Suppose you have two negative charges that uh, sit next to one another. Do they repel or do they attract? They repel. Are you sure? Okay, please wait a few minutes and I'll show you some examples where they actually don't repel, <laughs> just to set you in the mood. So I actually am going to start, start with, uh, uh, well, the to topic is water. And I start with the theme that most of you, most of you think, I believe, that you, you must think that all there is that is to be known about water is already known, right? No? Why not? <laughs> you think not? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, well, we know about entropy and such, but uh, water. So water has been studied for several hundred years by scientists, and water is a simple molecule. So you'd expect that by now it, it ought to be that whatever there is to know about water, we must already know. So I, the first few slides are designed to uh, demonstrate that actually you really don't know what you, you, uh, about water. So let me, let me start with this one. This is a, a common slide. It's, it's a cloud over water. And the first question is, well, the, the cloud is made from little droplets of water that come together in some condensed fashion. And water, as you know, is heavier than air. Gravitation pulls it down. So I have a question for you. What keeps the cloud up? Or have you never thought about that question? Do you know the answer? <laughs> no. I mean, it's not so obvious, I think. Uh, maybe you do. do. Anybody suggest how the cloud stays up? Because they're lighter, but water, the cloud is made of water droplets, and the water droplets are heavier than air. You take a pail of water and turn it over, it goes down, right? It doesn't go up. So how is it possible that the water, the cloud is essentially water, and so why should it be that the cloud stays up? Pressure. Someone said pressure? Well, what do you mean pressure? How does that explain it? Airflow. So airflow is always going up, is that it? If airflow were always going up, we would lose the atmosphere. You couldn't breathe. So that's not it. Someone said charge. Okay, I think you're, you're, uh, you're getting to the right, but l l let me go on. So, so here's another question that maybe is not so simple to answer. So this cloud is sitting right up above the water, right? Now, the water is evaporating from here, and so it's kind of straightforward to understand that the evaporating water comes to form a cloud up here, but the water also evaporates from here, and how come there's no cloud there? Anybody? The temperature, how does the temperature explain this? Yeah, something, you, you, yeah, something like this must happen, that somehow the water that's evaporating here must somehow come to the cloud, because it obviously doesn't go this way. It must be attracted somehow, but how, how does that occur? Do you know? Is it like a magnet? <laughs> what makes it do that? It's not so obvious, I, I think. Um, uh, we'll come back to that one. Uh, and here's another example. So droplets are falling, droplets of water are now falling on a surface of water. But you know when water and water come together, they coalesce pretty quickly, right? So what's going on here? How could this be? This is not some invention from the internet. This is from our laboratory, and you can see what happens. In fact, if you look outside and you see a puddle of water uh, and it's raining, you can actually see these droplets. They persist. So why is that? How can that be? Surface tension. Okay, surface tension. Where does the surface tension come from? And why, why, why does this persist for sometimes for for, for 20 seconds or 30 seconds before, before they eventually coalesce, does the surface tension just disappear somehow for some magical reason? It's not so obvious, I think. Uh, um, and here's, here's an, another one. 
Um, we'll, we'll deal with the answers to some of these questions later, and maybe they're the same as you surmised, but I think they might be different. Here are uh, two beakers of water, and you fill the beakers up to near the top, here and here, and then you stick one electrode in here and one electrode in here, and you impose a high voltage. Here's what happens. It forms a bridge, and then if you move mechanically, move one beaker away from the other, it persists. And it persists for distance up to three or four centimeters, and it persists essentially indefinitely. So tell me, how do you explain that? I hear silence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it, it forms a kind of, a kind of bridge, and um, um, this needs to be explained. And so, I mean, the point that I'm getting to is that if you knew everything there were to, was to know about water, you'd be able to explain all these phenomena just like that. You don't understand. And many people in the field of water, water chemistry and physics, don't understand either. So uh, a final slide in this series is, is my favorite. Uh, this one, this is a magnet. It's a superconducting magnet. It was demonstrated by a guy from the University of Tokyo. And here in the trough is, um, is a, a simple trough filled with water. And the guy who did the experiment poured some red dye just for, for effect. It turns on the magnet and the, the um, a Red Sea split so that Moses could actually walk through. <laughs> uh, can you explain that one? <laughs> okay, so the, the main point, just to kind of uh, uh, joke at, uh, early on, is that it, it's really not clear. There's so many phenomena associated with water that are unknown. And if we think we really understand the physical and chemical properties of water, we don't. Okay, so it's not just little H2O that's there that we fully understand. I, I got my own start um, from this fellow uh, who's now, if you do the arithmetic, I guess he's about 100 years old. Uh, he's in a nursing home right now. His name is Gilbert Ling, and Gilbert was a controversial guy. He came from China, the first group of scholars uh, after World War II. There were three who were chosen among uh, among all the uh, 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 PhDs, people who had just gotten their PhDs in, in, in China. And there were three of them, and uh, Gilbert was the biologist, there was a chemist, and there was a physics, physicist chosen from all over China. And the most famous one is not Gilbert Ling, uh, the most famous one is a guy named Yang, who won the Nobel Prize in physics. And in China, he's more famous uh, not because of his Nobel Prize, but because at age roughly 90, he married his translator, who was something like 32 or 33s, and I heard there were rumors that she's pregnant. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is a group of scholars, and, and Gilbert, uh, Gilbert is a really brilliant guy, and he focused on biology. Uh, in, and. His focus in biology uh, uh, started with, didn't start with, but after a while, with the idea that the water that's inside the cell, both plant cells and animal cells, is different from my prop here, a uh, glass of water. Why is it different? It's different because all of the molecules of water are lined up to one another. It's kind of like a, an ordered array of water molecules of crystals. Of course, here is much different because the water molecules are bouncing around at uh, many, many, many times per second or even femtosecond, um, and they're all randomly oriented. He said, and he provided evidence, that's not true. He said they're all lined up with one another. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, his ideas were not popular. And I met Gilbert uh, some years ago. I was formerly in, in a, a different field. I was studying muscles and muscle contraction. And I happened upon Gilbert Ling at a, a, a meeting somewhere in Hungary, and I was, I was so impressed. And I got one of his, now he, I think he's got seven books, and I gave one of those books to the students and postdocs in my laboratory. And the feedback I got from them was, yeah, it's pretty complicated stuff, but he's on to something really important. And if he's right, it's really a revolution in biology. So, I, what I tried to do is uh, uh, attempted to bring his message 
to the public. And in so doing, um, I wrote a book. Uh, this was published in 2001, Sales, Gels, and the Engines of Life. It's got a nice picture. Um, the, the reception of the book and bringing forth Gilbert's ideas and, and going somewhat beyond was mixed. Some, some thought this was nonsense and, and a lot of people thought this is pretty interesting stuff. So mixed reviews, but, but uh, discerning people really liked it. <laughs> um, as you can see, it's very popular among the two-year-old group. <laughs> uh, and so having, having written a book on the subject um, and presented the evidence for this, which I thought was really important. It went, went beyond and it suggested I was able to marshal the evidence in this book that the water and the water structure was central to everything in biology. It, it, it was a, a presentation that was in, in a sense a paradigm changer. At that time, we had no experiments at all uh, on, on water, and of course, we were, I, I was really curious to find out more about this kind of structured or ordered water. And so we're thinking, this is the, the key feature of this water is something like this, and this comes from Gilbert Ling's ideas, that inside the cell, you've got solids. Um, like a protein here with charges on the surface. This is typical of uh, proteins in other macromolecules inside the cell. Their uh, charges are exposed on the outside. And each one of these is a water molecule. It's like a dipole where you've got minus here or, or plus here and minus here and so on. So two charges together giving you a dipole. And the simple idea that seemed to make a lot of sense uh, was that you've got alternating charges of some sort on the surface and these dipoles then stick to the charges and they line up with one another. And physical chemists will su suggest that you might have two or three molecular layers of ordered water, but beyond that, uh, nothing because of Brownian motion, uh, thermal energy coming and disrupting the kinds of motion. But Gilbert argued that no, no, the, the, the power of organizational power here is, uh, is greater than the tendency to disorder so that these lined up molecules might extend dozens or even hundreds of molecular layers instead of two or three. So, so we started with, with that idea. And if you have molecules that are lined up like that, it's like a crystal. And crystals, as you know, exclude solutes and particles. So if something is forming ice, it forms a, or can form a pure crystal and pushes out all the impurities, uh, particles, the solutes, and such, to form this perfect crystal. So the idea was something like that. And we were looking for an experimental preparation where it was obvious that particles, for example, were excluded. And uh, by good fortune, I ran into a, a Japanese fellow who had told me about some results, and, and this was, uh, we really hit on something special. So it was really simple. Um, it's a, a, a gel, and the gel, this is like any gel that you might have, for example, for dessert or something, but um, we didn't particularly use, use that one. And it's put into a chamber, and, and uh, next to the gel, we poured water and particles. And the particles that you see are little spheres. They're known as microspheres because they're typically one micrometer in diameter. And we were looking for some sense of exclusion of that from some region. And you can see it here because here's the edge of the gel and here's a region, roughly 10 micrometers that you could see here, where these particles are excluded. And it's, in fact, it's, it's more dramatic than that because if you watch it over time, it seems that, that something is growing from the interface, uh, maybe ordered water, and pushing the particles away. And if you think of the size of this, this is roughly 50 micrometers. So 50 micrometers is, uh, those of you who have more hair than I have, uh, 50 micrometers is roughly half the thickness of one of your hairs. It seems pretty small, but by molecular standards, it's huge, huge region. And so if it's really true that this is a region where the water molecules are somehow organized, it's a big effect. So we got excited about it, as you, as you might uh, surmise. And a, a colleague from Australia said, ah, you've got to give it a name because you can't talk about a phenomenon without 
giving it a name. And so he suggested that we call it exclusion zone uh, because it excludes. And it turned out that's really convenient because at least in the US, exclusion zone, EZ, here it's, I guess, EZ, but, um, <laughs> but we, we say EZ. So we call this EZ water. And I'll demonstrate to you that really this is an area of water uh, where the molecules are ordered or aligned in some way. A second example, uh, besides this gel, is a piece of naphion. So what's naphion? Naphion is a polymer. It has a Teflon-like backbone, but it's got a lot of charge groups. And typically, it'll come in a sheet. And so it's, uh, although expensive, it's useful to take the sheet and cut it into some shape and plunk it down on the surface of the chamber. And you can see here, you can already see that there's a gap here where there are no microspheres. And once again, if you look at the video and see what happens, it expands over time. This is a time that would be about five minutes or something like that. And the size of this is roughly a half a millimeter. That's big. Uh, it's not 50 micrometers. This is, in this case, 10 times larger. This is seen with a microscope, but you don't need a microscope to see it because it's large enough that you can see it with your naked eye. So we thought this was uh, an exciting finding until we found out some years later that an almost identical finding was published in the journal Physiology London in 1970. Uh, so someone else found, found the same thing. But uh, a lot of people got interested, and I, I constructed this list before we actually knew that it had been published. And these are some people who duplicated these experiments and found the zone. So, so we're quite confident that these zones exist. And the question that I'll be getting to during the rest of this talk is, what does all this mean? And what significance does it have both for plants and, and animals? And speaking of plants, um, a guy, perhaps some of you know the name Martin Canny. Um, he passed a few years ago. He got interested in this. And he was looking at the xylem. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the species. I bet some of you will know just by, by looking at it. So here's a, a xylem vessel, roughly um, six, seven, eight micrometers. And in the experiment, he put uh, in the source, he, he put uh, microspheres in, and he sent a, a copy of this to me showing that there re really is an exclusion zone that exists uh, at the edges uh, of this. And so he thought, he thought that the, the idea of exclusion zones and such is highly relevant for plants. And I'll, I'll, I'll say some more about that later, because I think it is in terms of flow in plants. The exclusion zone may have something to say about the mechanism. So to get to the basis of it, I, I, of all this, I want to answer five questions. The first is, is the exclusion zone general? Or is it just those few slides I showed? I mean, is this something that happens routinely? Does it really arise from the ordering of water molecules? And um, can this ordering of water molecules explain those first few slides with which I challenge you? And what energy creates order? So we just heard about entropy and uh, disorder. But here we have order. And we're, we're going from, from disorder, uh, ordinary water molecules, to something that's ordered. To do that, you need energy. So where on earth did this, that energy come from? And you probably can figure out the answer, I think, some of you. But we'll talk about that. And, and might these findings apply broadly both to plants and, and animals? OK, so the first question about generality. Um, we, uh, the fir first question is, what kinds of surfaces will create this kind of ordering of, of water? And we tried uh, many different kinds of surfaces. The first is gels. So, we must have tried uh, uh, it, more than a dozen uh, gels, so-called hydrogels, which are gels made of water, just like gelatin dessert. And in every case, we found it. We tried various polymers, um, and, and we found these exclusion zones next to some, but not all. They had to be hydrophilic. That is, if you, if you remember, you know, if you drop some water on the surface, it spreads out. That's hydrophilic. On, 
unlike, uh, for example, Teflon, where you drop the water and it beads up. We never found it in situations like that. But we found that often, not every, every surface, but often with hydrophilic polymers. We tried uh, uh, multiple biological surfaces, and we saw it every time. We saw it next to a piece of muscle, for example. I was in the muscle field, so it, it was natural. Plant roots, we could see it routinely. Uh, cellulose, uh, we could see it. And finally, uh, we used monolayers, that is, uh, single molecular layers on gold functionalized in different ways to see if next to that single molecular layer we found exclusion zones. And we did. So why is that important? Well, it's important because it, it looks like there's a, a template effect. All you need is one molecular layer to create this. So it's something about, about the nature of that surface that produces it. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it happens pretty frequently. And what's excluded from the exclusion zone? Um, well, we studied solutes from big down to small. We started with huge particles, medium-sized particles, small particles, big molecules uh, like proteins, for example. Uh, we tried viruses, excluded, all are excluded. We tried various bacteria, and they're excluded. And then we tried various dyes going down from large molecular weight down to dyes whose size is roughly 100 or so excluded. And we think that salt is excluded too. The evidence for that is not conclusive, but I think very promising. So, so the conclusion of that, um, um, without going into in much detail, because I have a lot of other stuff to tell you, is that uh, many hydrophilic surfaces generate the exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded. So it's a general phenomenon. The second question is, is the zone physically different from ordinary, we say, bulk uh, water? And I've suggested that it might be, but I've shown you no evidence. So let me, I want to list the evidence. Uh, it's essentially all published. Um, I'll list eight pieces of evidence, and I'll tell you a little more about one of them. And if you, if you want to follow the evidence, please check the, the uh, publications. There are more than there's eight. There are probably a dozen by now. Uh, the first is that the easy water, the molecules are more constrained than ordinary water molecules. And we use nuclear magnetic resonance for that. Also, the molecules are more stable. And we know that from the infrared radiation that comes from the EZ. There's less of it. It looks colder. It's not moving as much as ordinary water. And the next one is that a kind of surprise for us is that the EZ has negative charge. So water is neutral, but this zone is typically negatively charged. And I'll go back to that in a moment because it's important. The EZ absorbs light at 270 nanometers. That's in the ultraviolet. And ordinary water doesn't at all. So it's distinctly different that way. It's about two orders of magnitude more viscous uh, than ordinary water. It has a, has a consistency, something like honey. Uh, the molecules inside are somehow aligned. And that's known through birefringence, uh, polarizing microscopy. The molecular structure uh, is, is different, and the optical properties are different. And this, this last one, it's uh, the refractive index. You know the lens effect. Um, this has a higher refractive index uh, than ordinary water. And this was, this was not in our lab, but by two different Russian laboratories, published the same year by two guys from Moscow who didn't know each other, and yet, one was doing a biological experiment, one was doing a physical experiment, and they got the same result, even quantitatively, uh, up to 11% higher refractive index. So, so this is a partial list of the evidence, which indicates that there, there's, this zone is really different from ordinary water. Now, what about this negative charge? How did we find that? Well, we found that using little electrodes. They're called microelectrodes. And this was, in fact, parenthetically invented by this same Gilbert Ling, who should have gotten a Nobel Prize for this because, because it was a breakthrough in biology. You could take these uh, electrodes and stick them into a cell and measure the electrical potential between the cell and outside the cell. And um, 
uh, it's, it, it, it was an uh, amazing uh, uh, invention. So we used these microelectrodes, um, and, and the way we did the experiment, the first experiment was we took, this is a chamber, we took a piece of nafion uh, here, and you know, nafion gives us an exclusion zone next to it, and we used a dye out here, and I'll get back to that dye in a moment because it's a special dye. The dye is the same dyes that you find in litmus paper, and so it looks like there's, it's a pH sensitive dye. It looks like there's a gradient of pH here, which I'll get back to because it's really important, but, but the ex in the experiment, we took the electrode and we stuck the electrode with a motor, uh, moving it closer and closer and going into the exclusion zone. And a real surprise was that we got a negative charge. So I was in the laboratory with a student or two and a, a visiting faculty member from Russia. And we couldn't believe the result. We thought it's got to be wrong because, after all, in this experiment, all we did was we had a chamber and a piece of nafion and we poured some water in. And water's neutral. So uh, we didn't expect anything like this. So Felix uh, was doubtful also. He got on the phone. He called his wife in Russia, who had been using microelectrodes and gels. And he said, honey, or dear, or whatever you say in Russian, <laughs> please, can you try the experiment? And in a few days, the result was, was the same. In their case, they, uh, they used a, a gel instead of nafion. And it had an exclusion zone. The exclusion zone was negative. So, so we, we knew that this was, was correct, and we'd also tried several gels. But still, even though it's correct, it doesn't make sense. Just think about it. You take a gel, and you put it into a chamber, and you pour some water in, and the water's neutral. So how on earth are you going to get a big zone with negative charge? Um, we were scratching our heads for a while, because we thought, it's got to be something wrong. and then. It occurred to us that one way that this could happen is if the water molecules split, as, for example, the first step in photosynthesis, split into OH minus and H plus. And if that really was the case, um, then it was possible somehow that the negative OH minuses would gather at, in this zone here to give you a negatively charged zone. But if that's true, there ought to be <coughs> H pluses somewhere else, right? And, and where are they? What's the evidence for that? Well, the evidence is actually right in front of you because this dye, this pH sensitive dye, which, by the way, doesn't get into the exclusion zone, um, uh, it, the molecular weight of the, of the various components here are roughly 100, and they don't get into the exclusion zone. But the red color means a pH of three or less. So it means. There's a huge concentration of protons sitting out here, and this is negatively charged. So from this evidence, it looked as though the water molecules were really splitting into negative here and positive here. Uh, of course, uh, again, we, we were doubtful. You know, we were hoping that that was the case because uh, it fits very nicely, but as you may know, it, it's, it's said that um, how does it go? Only artists love their models more than scientists. <laughs> so um, we, we, uh, we wanted a positive result, but of course we, wasn't, we, we weren't sure. And so we stuck, we, we did a test. We put one electrode in the negative and one electrode in the positive, and two electrodes in, connected through a resistor. Now, if the charges were really separated and you've got plus here and minus here, you ought to have current flow from plus to minus through that resistor, uh, if that was the case. So we were <laughs> holding our breath. And here is one of the first records. We have numerous now, current versus time. And we saw the flow. So the current begins at some high level. It gradually diminishes to some sort of plateau that maintains itself for quite some time. So it really confirms that that we do have a separation of charge, and that it appears that the water molecules are broken somehow into plus and minus, and I'll get to how uh, in a moment. So we really have <coughs> separation of charge, and what that means is that we basically have a charged battery in water. Here is the nucleating surface, a hydrophilic surface of sort, next to water, 
And this zone right here is the exclusion zone with negative charge, and here we have positive charge. Okay, so to summarize so far, um, for those of you who are remaining awake um, at this hour, uh, <laughs> good luck. Uh, so we have, a, we have a zone, an ordered zone of some sort, that is a, a liquid crystal where everything is, is organized. It has a negative charge, it's not neutral. Okay. It excludes solutes profoundly. It may not be, this dipolar model comes originally from Gilbert Ling, and it also is reproduced in my 2001 book. And I'm afraid to say that I think it's wrong. I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, although we were, of course, excited about this because of its simplicity uh, and, and beauty. So I'm not sure uh, that these dipoles are correct. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. I um, hate to admit that we were wrong, but we're, we were wrong. And this may extend very far. So what, what do we mean by very far? Well, if you do the arithmetic based on the size of the exclusion zone, we're talking not uh, two or three or 10 molecular layers of water, but something more than one million. So this is a, this is a completely different paradigm, uh, different from, from what you find in the textbooks. Um, and I think it has a, a lot to say about some of the physiological uh, properties that happen in plants and animals. So the idea of a fourth phase, a different phase, an ordered phase of water, is not new. Gilbert Ling was talking about uh, ordered water, but even, and even before him, Albert St. Georgi, uh, the famous Nobel laureate, uh, a Nobelist among Nobelists, a uh, really brilliant, brilliant guy, uh, discovered vitamin C, and, and he said, life is water dancing to the tune of solids. Uh, I, I like that one. He, he also said some other things like uh, discovery is seeing what everybody else has seen but thinking what nobody else has thought. He, he's a guy who's worth, worth uh, studying. But even before him, um, in, at the turn of the previous century, Sir William Hardy was a famous, well he's got Sir before his name so he must be famous. He was a colloid, uh, colloid chemist. Um, and physical chemist, and he said, something's wrong. He said, he said, water has many properties that we know of, even 100 years ago. He said, but the three phases that we have can't explain these properties. And so, you know, when you can't explain something with, with the prevailing theory, um, you, you call it an uh, outlier or an anomaly, but the number of anomalies began to increase. Now they're like 60 or 70 on a famous website. But he said, with so many observations that don't fit, we need a different phase of some, some different aspect or phase of water. And so what I mean to tell you is, is, is that the idea of a different phase of water, which we call fourth phase, just out of simplicity, is a very old idea, not a new idea. And what we found is, is simply is n nothing more than experimental verification of an idea that started 100 years ago. So it's nothing radical. Now, I mentioned about maybe those dipoles are wrong. So why would, why would that be wrong? Um, you know, uh, uh, well, well, it's wrong for a very simple reason. Okay, if you stack dipoles, each dipole has a plus and a minus. So you put the plus and minus together, it's neutral. It's like a little bean that's neutral, but charges separated. You start stacking these, and if each dipole is neutral, you can stack them from here to the moon, and you'll get neutrality only. But the experiments show that it's not neutral, it's negatively charged. So the logic is very simple, and therefore the model is wrong. And so. Um, unhappy as we are to, to admit it, we have to admit um, that, that the molecules are wrong. And um, I thought to go through step by step in, in the development of uh, the model that we did come up with, but I knew that I was going to talk at the end of the day and the end of the, the meeting, and so I decided to skip it and just give you the result. And if any of you are interested, it's actually not very complicated, but it takes a few steps. I'll just show you the end result, and if, if you're interested, we could talk further or you could look in my 
uh, recent book. And it looks something like this. So you have a, a material of some sort next to water. Instead of having these dipoles, the water molecules build up in this direction. Instead, you have these sheets. We call them easy layers. And as you can see, the sheets are hexagonal. Hexagonal hexagons are very common in nature. Mother Nature seems to like that structure. And so, so what happens is that from the water, these sheets, easy layers build, and they're going to hear another one and another one and so on. And each sheet is actually slight, slightly displaced from the one behind it. It's half of the oxygen-oxygen distance. It's shifted in, in, in one direction. And those of you who know this, the structure of ice this is actually not so different from ice. It's slightly different, but it's not extremely different because ice is also a, um, a stack of, you might say, hexagonal sheets where the sheets are actually lined up with one another. So, I'll say a little more about that later, but it's important that this structure is not just taken from like a rabbit from a hat. It, it, uh, it closely mimics a known structure of water, but is different, slightly different. So if you look uh, at the structure, uh, you can see the hexagons here consisting of oxygens and hydrogens making the structure. And if you were to count, if you count the number of oxygens and hydrogens in one unit cell, it turns out that it's not H2O. Um, and you wouldn't expect it to be H2O because H2O is neutral. But we need something that's negative. And the structure, if you do the count of this, is H3O2. So we think the chemical formula for, for uh, the EZ is H3O2. See, if this were H4O2, it would be double this and it would be neutral. But lacking one positive charge, you see, it turns out to be to have negative charge. So, this is a liquid crystal, and um, some of you may know that if you have a liquid crystal, liquid crystals should be able to be solidified. And 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 the question is, well, you know, can it really be solidified? Because that's what we would expect. But it's kind of weird because if you're able to solidify it then you'd have solid water of some kind at room temperature. And you've never seen solid water at room temperature. Um, but you should be able to get something like this. Um, uh, an example is, is uh, sugar, a sugar solution, which has crystalline properties. I think it was Pasteur who, who first noted that. It bends light a certain, certain ways. But if you stick a thread in and wait long enough, then you get something like this. Um, which is good tasting to, uh, to, to some people. So, so the question is, can you do the same thing with easy water? Can you take easy water and turn it into a solid uh, material? And, and the answer is yes. We didn't do it, but it was Vittorio Elia uh, from Naples. Actually, I should say it was his wife who did most of it. Uh, she, she did the labor. And, and what they did is they took a sheet of naphion and they put some water on it and the water after five minutes would become mostly easy water and they scraped it off and put it into a container and they repeated this thousands of times to get enough volume. And if you take that water and put it into a beaker, you get something that looks like this. So this is obviously the clear water. You can get some water as you do the scraping off, but the easy water forms these clouds um, you might think of a connection between these clouds and the clouds that are up there. But, but the real experiment is, is not this because that's not any proof. The real experiment is to remove the free water. And there's a technique that's used by, by um, biochemists to do that. They, it's called lyophilization. It's like freeze drying. You reduce the temperature, put a vacuum on, and that pulls out all the free water. And so they did that experiment and um, bring it back up to room temperature. And this is the result. So here's the stuff in the flask. And the residue that you see at the bottom is easy water. Um, this is a solid. You can actually scrape it from there and you could put it in your fingers. We, we, we handled it. It's extremely valuable because of the amount of time it takes to produce and the number of experiments to get enough volume. But they've been able to do it. and. Using the mass spectrometer, they were able to confirm that this has almost no impurities. It's all hydrogen and oxygen, uh, which is so. This is 
Solid water, EZ water at room temperature. Amazing. Solid water at room temperature. I, I like this experiment. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so now the question is, um, going back, a third question is, can this crystalline water explain counterintuitive anomalies? So we go back to the cloud. Um, wh why, why do we expect that, that water that's rising from here won't form the cloud and might actually get attracted uh, to here? Obviously, Sometimes you get clouds that do cover the entire sky. You know, when you live in Seattle in the winter, you very rarely see the sun. But, and I think the, uh, the mechanism uh, has something to do with the question that I started with about two negative charges. Do they really repel? Uh, um, and, and so here, uh, uh, this is, has to do with the cloud, which I'll come back to in a moment. So suppose you have two two particles, one here and one here, and you drop them into a beaker of water. And suppose they're pretty near each other so that one can feel the charge of the other. And the question is, um, um, if these particles form easy water with negative charge and positive charges get formed also, as I've shown you earlier, as a result of the water splitting into negative uh, and positive. So you have two of these, and the question I ask is, are these two negatively charged particles, they're near each other, does the distance between them increase or decrease? So what do you think? Those of you who know the answer, please don't blurt out. <laughs> but what do you think? Uh, decrease, why would they decrease? <laughs> I put you on the spot. Okay, the, an the correct answer is it decreases. And, um, uh, something like, like this, and, and the answer comes from the great physicist Richard Feynman, uh, the, many people would say the Einstein of the uh, end of the 20th century, um, who's a godlike figure among most physicists who, who read through his three-volume set of lectures assiduously. Uh, almost every American graduate student reads it. Anyway, he came up with the idea, and I think it was his Nobel lecture, and he called it, he, he said they come together, and the reason they come together is like likes like. So what does that mean? Well, you know, the two of these like each other, and because they like each other, if you like someone, you like to get close, and so these two like each other, and they, they approach one another. He said, that was only the first half, he said, like likes like because of an intermediate of unlike. So here's an intermediate of unlike charges. But up to, up to this point, it wasn't clear, at least I could discern from his work, where these unlike charges come from. But now I think you know where they come from because as, as, <coughs> excuse me, as these negatively charged EZ layers build, positive charges um, are built as well, and they're cast out beyond the EZ. And the region here has a lot of them because you have contributions as this EZ builds, you get positives, and as this EZ builds, you get positives too. So you get a large concentration of positives, and these positives attract the negative and bring it together, and this one together. So they begin coming together. Now, the principle is actually one that was known for a thousand years. How do I know it's known for a thousand years? Well, if you remember, the first novel, The Tale of Genji, and it was written roughly a thousand years ago, maybe eight or nine hundred, and, and The Tale of Genji in, in Japan was about parties that were at war, clans that were at war with one another, and they would never get together unless you provided the um, impetus in between. And so like likes like because of an intermediate of, of unlikes, it's a very old principle. Nothing new, nothing esoteric, nothing involving deep physics. So they come together. Now, when do they stop? Well, so you can imagine that you get a stability when, when the attractive force, that is the pluses, attracting the minuses, uh, balance the repulsive force where the negatives repel each other. When attractive and repulsive forces are in balance, everything is stable. So these two will remain 
um, at, at that position in a stable situation. And if you have more than, um, than two, if you have a lot of them, you get something that looks like this. Um, and that's called a colloid crystal. And some of you may be familiar with it, uh, where uh, this is, I actually, if you, if you had yogurt this morning, as I did at, at the hotel, um, this is probably the structure of yogurt. The colloids are held together by opposite uh, charges, and so essentially they stick together because of like, like, like. And I, it's possible that the same uh, situation occurs in the clouds because, because the clouds consist of negatively charged droplets and the atmosphere has a lot of positive charges. And so one way that you can get a cloud, you know, the idea of condensation of water, at least has never been clear to me, but this makes sense because you start with the negatively charged droplets and the positive charges by the like-likes-like mechanism keeps it together. And you can imagine if you've got another droplet negatively charged here or some other place, it gets attracted by the positive and it joins the cloud. You see, so the cloud can grow bigger in this way. And in, in such a way, you could imagine that the evaporated uh, water or water droplets get attracted to the cloud. So you're missing everything here, but the cloud can grow bigger. Okay, another, um, another point is, uh, this is maybe familiar to some of you. Uh, um, this is an old Hungarian coin uh, floating on the top of the water. It's fairly lightweight, but I think some of you have tried the experiment where you take a paper clip, you know, if you, if you, if you immerse it, it, it sinks right down, but if you carefully place it on the surface, despite its higher density, it floats, you know, and, and you can do the same with a pin. And, and the question is, what's going on? Well, um, the prevailing idea is it has something to do with surface tension. Water is known to have a high surface tension. So you can imagine a, a, a sheet on top of the water that may hold it up. But, but this is usually thought of as involving a single molecular layer where hydrogen bonds between water molecules, the very top layer, one, one water molecule wants to form a hydrogen bond with, with the next one, and, and does, but there's no water up there because it's the top layer. So the hydrogen bond swings down, joins together with another water molecule, and so the top molecular layer of water has some extra, 25% extra hydrogen bond, so it becomes uh, stiffer, more surface tension. We wondered whether that was sufficient, a single molecular layer, that's a third of a nanometer, it's pretty thin, to, to be able to do this. And, and, and so we thought, maybe this has something to do with easy water on the top. And so we did the experiment, and we indeed found that this easy water, or something close to it, grows at the air-water interface. So here's, here's the experiment, um, and we make a chamber uh, here out of two sheets of glass sealed around the edges, and we pour in water and microspheres. That's why it looks cloudy, because the microspheres scatter light. So we have the air at the top, we have a meniscus here, um, and we have water and microspheres here, and we found that um, starting immediately and ending at about 15 or 20 minutes, a clear zone, that is, a uh, microsphere-free zone uh, is created and remains stable for uh, up to a, a day or so. So, so we have a clear zone that's just like an EZ because it's microsphere-free. Then uh, one of my students was curious and stuck the microelectrode, and he found that this zone had a large negative electrical potential. So, so far, the same characteristics as an EZ. And <coughs> the next slide will show that this, this zone over here is, is like a, a thick gel-like band. It's not water, not pure water, but it behaves like a, a, a gel or a rubber band. And, um, and that's shown here. Um, you can see this is a glass rod, and this is the water plus microspheres, and here's the clear zone. And what I'm going to show you is that when you uh, perturb this uh, water with microspheres, by sticking a probe down, the, the height or thickness of this hardly changes at all, as you might expect of a, like a rubber band. Uh, so here, here it is. 
it comes up. You see the thickness is almost changing, not at all, and you move it back and forth. And so it's, co it's a cohesive band of some sort. So it looks like, it looks like many structured layers create uh, the high surface tension, not one single molecular layer, but like an EZ at the top. And um, it's possible that some of the support beyond the Archimedes principle, some of these layers actually help support uh, large vessels. But more interesting than that is, uh, is this creature, which some of you know about. This is a lizard. It lives in Central America. And it lounges around most of the day sitting, sitting on this uh, tree branch. But when stimulated by what I don't think anybody knows, the lizard jumps in the water and it walks on the water. So because it walks on water, it's called the Jesus Christ lizard. <laughs> and, and um, you know, you can see it here. It's amazing. Uh, and the question is, what supports it? And I think the answer is a thick, easy layer is uh, supporting it. OK, another point is that crystals can be pretty stiff. So some of you have diamond rings or rubies or such. And it's, uh, it's pretty stiff. So when you go back now to the water bridge, this is extremely stiff. I mean, this is not water. Water doesn't behave this way. This is uh, this, this bridge. You can actually calculate the stiffness if you know the length, uh, the diameter, and the amount of droop. It's very stiff. Water doesn't do that. But if this is easy water, a crystalline water, it can become, as we know, crystals can be stiff. So I, I think it's likely that the explanation for this falls into the idea that this is actually an easy um, uh, structure that runs across. So um, the answer to, to question three, I, I, I haven't presented, presented all, but um, I, I presented a few, a few examples uh, that of of anomalies that can actually be explained uh, in a fairly ready way by, by the easy water. Now, one that I didn't include, which I was reminded in the last presentation that I should have included, is, is a, a gel. So some of you have made jello before, or gel it in dessert. It's 95% water, right? Um, I handled some gels in Japan that are not 95%, but 99. 99.95% water. It's essentially all water. And you can pick up the gel, and, and the water doesn't leak out. So you, you'd kind of expect that you know, there ought to be a shower of water, but it stays inside the gel. And I think the reason it stays inside the gel is that the gel is made of a matrix of polymers and, um, and, or proteins, and, and they're hydrophilic. And the water that's inside the gel is not ordinary water. It converts to easy water. And the easy water is sticking to those surfaces of the gel. And the reason I'm reminded of that, because I think that is the answer, is about the soil and the previous presentation that talked about water in the soil. So um, according to the material that I presented, it's possible that, that one reason why the water stays inside the sponge is because the sponge is made of hydrophilic material. Uh, and so if the soil is hydrophilic and roughly the right pore size, the water should stick in. And I, I think it's possible that that's maybe involved in the mechanism of, of, of the spongy soil. With the right properties, easy water should form. OK, so a question for um, this, what I've shown you so far is like a battery. Right, it's uh, uh, plus and minus that are separated. And everybody knows that batteries need charging. So at the end of the day, you plug your, your smartphone, and you can use it the next day. But if you don't do it, it runs down. So we have a battery here. And the question is, what charges the battery? Because you can't, you can't build order and separate charge without energy. We spent several years and couldn't figure out the answer. You know, obviously, you can't plug the chamber into the receptacle, 220 volts. That, that's not what's doing it. And, and we finally knew the answer. I'll tell you in a moment. Maybe it's obvious to you. Um, and when we knew the answer, I was giving a class to some students. And 
I said to the students, well, what do you think is, where does the energy come from? The same question I'm asking you. And one student, Tim, pardon me? Light, yeah, one student, right. Um, one student raises his hand and he didn't know anything about this material, so timidly he says, light? <laughs> and we quickly snared that student and had him working in the laboratory because he knew what he was talking about. And so, yeah, sure, the answer is, is light. How did we know it was light? A student was doing an experiment he wasn't supposed to do. <coughs> so he's got the chamber uh, sitting on the bench, um, and, and next to him is a, a lamp. So he takes the lamp and shines it on the chamber. And, and the result, this is a real result, although the lamp is not re real, obviously. This is a piece of naphion. And here is the EZ, and here are the microspheres. And typically, this runs parallel uh, like this to the naphion surface. But it was immediately clear that where the lamp was illuminating this region, the exclusion zone grew uh, considerably. And when you remove the lamp, it went back to the original, you see. So uh, it, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, that you know, if you turn the light on and it's, it's growing bigger, then maybe the energy for building this comes from photons, from light. And of course, the, the, the relevance to, um, to plants and such is, is obvious. Um, and we found, we checked a whole series of wavelengths using lighting emitting diodes uh, ranging from the UV all the way through the infrared to find out which wavelength is most powerful. And the most effective we found was infrared energy. So for a lot of people, um, a lot of people don't, don't know uh, uh, really about infrared and where it, where it comes from. Uh, some comes from the sun, of course, but in fact, you, you know that if you look at the electric range and it glows bright orange or a toaster or something, you feel the heat, and the, the heat is basically infrared energy that's being, being released. So, in fact, it's coming from everywhere, and uh, it's, it's freely available. So, it's free energy. It's literally free. It doesn't cost a nickel um, or even a euro, um, and it's there all the time, you see. So, so and I you could easily demonstrate just by turning off the lights and taking out an infrared camera. You know, if you use a normal camera on your cell phone, you'll see nothing because it's too dark. If you use your eyes, you'll see nothing because it's too dark. But the infrared camera is sensitive to the infrared wavelengths, and you get a beautiful picture of everybody in this room, including the, the chairs and uh, um, uh, Mark's uh, name tag and such, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always there, it's free. And because it's always there, it means that um, if you have a hydrophilic material next to water, you'll always have some easy water because of the ambient infrared that's always present. And if you add more infrared, then it grows bigger. And if you take it away, then it goes back to the original size. So it's a very simple uh, paradigm. Uh, this is built by infrared. It's not the only wavelength, but by far it's more powerful than any of the others. So the answer to question number four about energy is that easy buildup is powered by light, and the light orders the water and charges the water battery. So the situation looks sort of like this, you know, a trip to Hawaii, <laughs> you lie, lie in the sun and you get all charged up. It's very simple. On the other hand, if this is true, if this is true, then what's happening to all the energy that's coming into this battery. If it keeps absorbing energy, uh, it's gonna blow up eventually because it, it's gotta get rid of the energy somehow. It could be re-radiated out, but you might expect that if this is, this is absorbing energy all the time, uh, that you'd be able to harvest this energy and use it for something. But uh, I think that probably none of you have ever seen a glass of water doing work, right? Sorry? Blood? Oh yeah, well, we'll get to that. Right, okay, yeah, photosynthesis. Yeah, it's directly relevant to that. Um, so, uh, but I'm gonna show you um, a way that this energy can actually get used for something practical. Uh, and uh, 
Yes, absolutely, photosynthesis. There's, I think, a very close relation to from what I'm showing you and the first step in photosynthesis. First step of photosynthesis is splitting water into plus and minus. This is exactly what we have here. Um, and the energy comes from light. And one of the problems in the first step in photosynthesis, which I understand is 100% efficient, one of the problems is that when the water breaks into plus and minus, usually plus and minus attract each other. Why do they want to separate? I think this is an unresolved uh, question, but if the mechanism, if the first step of photosynthesis resembles what I've been talking about, then there's no problem because we have a way, a mechanism where these negatives come and form this, this easy structure. But anyway, uh, this is another, the experiment was done by another student who was doing what he was not supposed to do. <laughs> okay, so we found, we had found that Nafion uh, comes in, in uh, tubes, and we thought, oh, let's start playing with the tubes because it should be interesting to find out. So his project was to find out whether there was an EZ outside here and also an EZ inside here. Uh, and he started doing the experiment, and one day um, he comes into my office and I'm sitting with a visitor. I don't remember if it was an important visitor or not an important visitor, but he came barging in. And he said, you know, I found something that's pretty important, I think. So, okay, tell me what's important. What do you see? He said, well, I noticed when I was doing the experiment that the water was flowing through the tube and never stopped. So, I, I, I'd like to say that I wasn't thrilled that he interrupted my discussion with my visitor, but I can't even remember who the visitor was. But I thought, this is really interesting because Usually, if you get flow through a tube, you need to have pressure to push it, a pressure differential. But there's no pressure differential here because the tube is lying flat and the height of water above here and above here is the same. So what's, where does the energy come from? And I knew, we had done the experiments, and we knew that the light energy was being absorbed and might be used somehow. So I thought, if his experiment was correct, and we checked, and of course, and we found that it was correct, that since work is done um, in order to achieve this, there must be energy that comes in, and it would be uh, evidence for the kind of absorption of light that we, we had already found. So I was excited about this, and we started experiments. And it looks like this. You take a piece of tube, and you fill the tube with, with water, and you make sure that there are no air bubbles, and then you stick it into the chamber with water and microspheres and take it over to the microscope. We use green light here. And this is what, um, this is what you find. Um, you find um, the water flowing. And we've had this flowing in Nafion for as much as a day and a half and we would, before it stops. And we know how to make it uh, uh, go even, even longer than that. So someone said, ah, you know, it's probably some weird effect of this Nafion tube. It's got to be more general than that, otherwise we won't believe it. And so we're looking for hydrophilic tubes that are small, of this size, and we can't find any. So we decided to make our own tubes. And how do you make a tube? We took a gel. As the gel was forming, uh, we had to put a wire inside. And, and just as it was forming a gel, you pull out the wire, and you have a tunnel that's left. So you have a, a block of gel with a tunnel that goes from the, in the block from one end to the other, um, a tunnel. And, and we've done it with a, a number of different gels. Actually, by now, I think seven or eight different gels. And this is one example. They all show the same result. This is a polyacrylic acid gel. Here's the gel, here's the gel, here's the tunnel. And as soon as we take the block of gel with the tunnel, immerse it in the water plus microspheres, uh, an easy, uh, well, the, the water plus microspheres invade the tunnel, the easy builds, the easy builds, and here you've got all the microspheres that get pushed out of the easy, and here's the, you can see what happens, and it happened in every one of the gels that we tried it with. So this is more general than just Nafion. It seems that any of these situations where you have an easy uh, that grows, with negative charge here and positive charge here, you'll have flow that occurs. And someone said, we listen to people, <laughs> someone said, if you really think this is driven by light somehow, why don't you just increase the light? 
and see what happens. So we increased the light, and we found that we could get the flow to speed up by five times. And this is published the past couple of years. So, so what's going on to cause this? Uh, well, if you look at the, uh, this is the Nafion tube here, right? There's an exclusion zone out here and microspheres here, exclusion zone here and microspheres uh, here. So we know that the exclusion zone is negatively charged. You can see that um, here. And uh, negative charge EZ, and the positive charges are in here, which we were able to confirm. So the EZ is more or less stuck to the surface, but these positive charges are free in the water. And as they concentrate and build up inside the tube, they want to exit. They all repel each other. Since they repel each other, they want to get as far away from each other as possible. So they'll go either this way or this way. Um, and I know somebody's going to ask me the question later, which way, and I can answer it later. But anyway, we, we think that uh, this is the mechanism of, of the so-called spontaneous flow that occurs. It's spontaneous. It's not that you get something for nothing. It's built on the energy that's absorbed by the water, which is driving all this. So basically, um, for this, work is done. Therefore, energy is required unless somebody could find another source of energy that we haven't figured out. The energy absorption from the environment, the light, is a necessary condition, which, uh, um, so the water is basically a transducer that transduces light energy here into mechanical energy. There are a couple of more uh, transductions I don't have time to talk about. So for most people, this is really weird to think of water as a transducer. But if you think about it, um, you guys like to deal with stuff like this, and, and you know that the energy um, comes from, from the light, and so, so the light somehow builds chemical potential which drives growth, metabolism, uh, bending, you, you, you name it. And I'm suggesting to you that pretty much the same thing happens in water. Uh, just water. And it's not a surprise because the plant is made uh, essentially mostly of water. So what you observe for the plant seems also true of the water. And since today we're dealing with physics, we come up with this equation, um, which looks suspiciously like an iconic equation that you, that you know of, beginning with E equals. But um, uh, basically what we're suggesting is that a, gl a glass of water like this contains energy. You don't think of it, you think of this being in equilibrium with the environment, at least that's what we're taught in school, but actually it's absorbing energy and converting that energy to different kinds of, uh, of, of energy. Um, and, and so um, you, you already got to the point I was going to get to is that the light-induced charge separation is very similar to the first step of photosynthesis, and it might be, we're not sure, it might be that what I've shown you is actually a generic kind of first step in photosynthesis and, and that the plant has specialized by using chlorophyll, um, uh, which, which, which is a hydrophilic surface that enhances the separation of charge somehow, but the two are actually rather similar to one another. Okay, so why is all this important? I think it's foundational for any or all science involving water and molecules and, and light, uh, um, and, and, and perhaps foundational for health, both for animals and, and plants. So let, let me start with, with humans, like you, I think, <laughs> and me. So we, uh, we absorb light all the time. And the question is, do we use light or don't we use light? And I think most of you will say, ah, humbug, we don't, we don't use light uh, at all. We may re-radiate it. But if you think about Mother Nature being as clever as, as she is, suppose you're Mother Nature and you invent uh, uh, single cell organisms and green plants, and you've got a pretty nice energy transduction mechanism going. And then one day you decide, hmm, I think I'll invent animals, right? So what would you do? Would you, would you discard this beautiful mechanism of photosynthesis and switch over immediately to, 
to a mechanism that uh, doesn't involve light at all, or would you retain it? I think uh, in her wisdom, Mother Nature might retain it, which, which would imply that animals also use light, that you use light, just like the plants use, use light. So I'm thinking, where is the most likely place that this could happen? And I started my career um, as a graduate student uh, doing modeling uh, of, of this human circulation, that it pressures and flow throughout the body. And I'm thinking, you know, a, a possible place could be in the cardiovascular system because capillaries are pretty superficial, right? And the light comes in at some wavelengths and reaches the capillaries. Maybe somehow, somehow um, the light, similar to what we demonstrated a few slides back, maybe the same thing is, is happening, that the light is causing flow. So at first I thought, um, you know, this doesn't make any sense until how could light do something to our circulation? It sounds preposterous. Until I went to Russia and I visited my friend Vladimir at Moscow University who wanted to introduce me to the next door neighbor. So the next door neighbor comes to me and says, there's a big problem in the circulation. So what's the problem? <laughs> you know, I, I came rather arrogantly because I thought I knew what there was to know about the circulation. He said, there's a really big problem. Okay, tell me the big problem. The big problem is this. Um, the red blood cells are six or seven micrometers, uh, and, and, and some of the capillary vessels can be three to four uh, micrometers, half the size of the junk that has to pass through. And that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it sounds like, like Mother Nature made a big mistake because a plumber would never do this. You know, sometimes stuff gets stuck in your toilet. Um, and even though they try to make the, uh, um, the pipes big enough, you need to use a plunger to, to, uh, to push it through, and it requires energy. Well, the same principle applies um, in the cardiovascular system. You need to push it through. And in order to push it through, um, the way it happens, you can see here, the red blood cells are supposed to look like this, but this is a piece of muscle tissue with red blood cells. I'll show you the video in a moment. And, and the red blood cells need to squeeze in order to get through. Here's the, the video, you can kind of see it. Um, you see, this guy up here is having a difficult time. So they computed the amount of energy that's required to drive these red blood cells through these narrow channels. It's very similar to the plunger in the toilet. Um, and they calculated that if the heart were really responsible for doing this, the heart would need to develop a pressure, something like one million times the pressure that your heart and my heart develop. That's high blood pressure. <laughs> um, so uh, also you'll notice here that if the heart were responsible, you'd be seeing uh, pulses of flow every time. Sorry. Whoops. Uh, I think we just failed here. Every time the heart beats, <laughs> this should go through. But you can see it's smooth flow. It seems disconnected from the heart. So there, these Russian guys are proposing all sorts of possible mechanisms, none of which made sense to me, and I'm thinking, we just saw in the laboratory flow that comes out of nothing, actually from infrared energy that's coming from the environment and getting absorbed in the water. So of course, <laughs> the hypothesis came that maybe the radiant energy, the light, is actually what's driving the flow, not only in this situation, but in your cardiovascular system. That, that the flow, certainly in the big vessels, it comes from the heart, but when you get down to the small ones and you need a lot of energy to drive those through, it may be coming from infrared energy. So this is the question, might infrared energy help drive blood flow? Um, so we started checking the literature and my student found something really interesting. It was an Israeli uh, scientist and they were, they were studying blood flow in mice. So they would take the mouse and cut the mouse open and do some maneuvers that were part of their experiment. And at the end of their experiment, they clamp the aorta and the, the mouse responds favorably by perishing. Uh, and, but they found something weird. They found that even though the mouse was dead, 
The flow continued. Weird. It continued for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, more than one hour. And they repeated the experiment uh, multiple times, and they got the same result. So it turns out, turns out if you do a literature search, you can find the half dozen papers that show that when you die or the animal dies, flow continues at much lower speed, but it continues. The heart is not beating, but the flow is continuing. So we thought that it's pretty likely that this same mechanism that we saw in the laboratory is occurring for you. And so we did the following experiment. It's just finishing up right now. My student, Li Zheng, is uh, looking at the chick embryo, a three-day-old chick embryo. And you can see the vessels developing. The heart is here. And here's the eggshell. And we removed the top of the eggshell. And he was focusing with the microscope on either this region or this region to see what happens uh, after the, the blood flow stops. So he injected potassium chloride in the heart. And that's known for stopping the heart. And the heart did stop. But here's, <clears throat> excuse me, here's the, the result. So this is, on this axis is flow. And this is time. And so as soon as you stop the beating, the flow diminishes considerably. But it's not zero. It persists. And then he turns on the infrared, because that's the signature feature of this flow mechanism uh, that we described. And you can see what happens after a short interval. The flow increases about three times. And then you turn it off, and it goes down back to the control level. So it appears that radiant energy does help drive uh, blood flow. And, um, and the same thing. In fact, uh, we have some experiments with uh, onion, a sheet of onion, a, a layer of onion taking the same, same result. Ten minutes. Okay, you got it. Uh, so, um, uh, where was I? Uh, so if you think about, if you think about uh, what's the mechanism for driving fluid up a 100-meter tree, which is uh, an unsolved problem, uh, I think, it's possible that it's the same mechanism that we're talking about, that you get this spontaneous flow that's driven, that's driven by infrared energy. And uh, I think that explains nicely why, why the flow depends on the season. So starting in the springtime and, uh, and summer, you have green leaves, the flow is, is moving, and I think it's because the infrared energy the higher temperature comes in and turns on the flow. And the flow uh, continues. So you have hydrated green leaves. And then in the autumn, when it gets cooler and there's less infrared energy coming, um, and then the flow stops and, and you get uh, dehydration. So the protons are responsible for, uh, for doing the job according to the model that, that we came up with. And these protons have a lot of power. And I just want to illustrate. Um, so, if you take two surfaces and you rub them over one another, um, you get a lot of friction. Uh, it's like sandpaper. You take two pieces of sandpaper and you rub it, and it's really hard to rub. The friction is huge. But if you could separate those two pieces, then there's no friction anymore. And I, I think this principle holds in a lot of different situations. So, if you have a, a rough surface here and a rough surface here, but they're hydrophilic, and therefore, they develop negatively charged EZs, and here too. And the protons all build up here. And if they build up enough, they're going to push these surfaces apart. If there's not many protons, it acts like glue. But as soon as you have a sufficient number, the repulsion takes over, and these surfaces will separate. And then you can easily move one past another. So if you think about ice skating, um, uh, it, it was actually Michael Faraday who showed that on the surface of ice, you actually have a liquid layer. And we know that uh, from our experiments, I haven't had time to show you, that when ice melts, it turns into easy water plus protons. The structures are very similar to one another. And so the easy water is sitting at the surface here. And if you get enough protons, if they repel each other, the blade is actually sticking up above the ice. It never touches the ice. And therefore, you get almost no friction. And therefore, when you go ice skating, it's easy. Another application of that is building the pyramids. So 
You know, when the pyramids got built, there were quarries, at, sorry? Uh, quarries at some distance away. And, and the way they did it was they'd stick a, a, a wedge of wood inside a small crack, and then they'd pour water, and it was sitting in the sun, and it cracked open. So why does it crack open? I think the reason it cracked open is because easy water builds uh, in the water and releases protons. And the protons gather here and here, and when you get enough of them, they repel each other, and the force is extremely strong, so it cracks, it cracks the, um, uh, the, the, the rock, and then you can take a piece of rock that's, uh, that's not too large to carry. So um, back to humans, the uh, question is, What's the role of radiant energy elsewhere in the body? Um, and, and I just want to get to your health, these, these last few slides. Okay. So I think, I think the role of light or radiant energy is not just in the cardiovascular system, but throughout your body, in every cell in your body, and of course in every cell in the plant's body too. So you have... Um, a cell here, that, um, and you have proteins inside the cell. The proteins have charges on their surface. They build negatively charged EZ water. And the situation is more dramatic than this because the crowdedness is enormous. And because of the crowdedness, you have a lot of these negative uh, charges from uh, EZ water that fill the cell. Uh, and also, I don't want to take the time, but some of you know that the insides of cells are always negatively charged, whether in plants or animal cells. And there's reason to think that the mechanism is not due to pumps and channels, which some of you know about and you'll find in the textbook, but actually it's due to the negatively charged easy water. Um, I, I don't, don't have time to talk about it. But now, negative charges repel each other. They want to get out of here, and that represents potential energy. Right? If they could get out, they would release that potential energy. Um, and I believe that this potential energy is actually used in the folding of proteins. I'll explain in, in a moment. You know, the work of the cell is done, your cells, by the folding of proteins. So if you have a muscle cell, uh, the proteins will go from this state to this state, folding and giving you contraction. If it's a nerve cell, uh, then the same thing happens, and when the proteins undergo this conformational change, uh, they drive information transfer. If it's a secretory cell, the proteins do the same thing, and something will be secreted from the cell. So it's a very general mechanism. And what happens, this is described in my uh, 2001 book, is that uh, typically, so you have, a, you have a, a protein, and it's got the easy water around it, and what happens is that easy water melts, and then the protein can undergo its, its folding, and then it goes back again, completing the cycle, and the easy water builds up again. But if you don't have easy, it can't do what it's supposed to do because the environment is foreign to it, and the easy water is, in fact, part of the protein stuck to it. So the protein finds itself in a different environment, doesn't know what to do, misfolds, can't folds, whatever, and that's pathology. So you, what you want to do is make sure that there's always enough easy water in the cell to let the cell do what it wants to do. But getting back to the potential energy, so I, I'm suggesting to you that the potential energy from all of these negative charges here drives the work of the cell. So if you, if you connect the dots, remember, light builds the easy, then you get negative charge, the positive charges leak out of the cell, repelling each other, and this is potential energy, and this energy is used for work or folding of these, of these proteins, and therefore the equation is basically that light is responsible for at least some of the work of the cell, of the folding of the, of the proteins. So this is, I think, an important concept, and it leads to the question, where do we get our energy? So you and I um, get most of our energy, or at least some of our energy, obviously, from food. But I would like to suggest to you that we can also get energy from light. Um, and um, the light is absorbed by the water, builds easy, and therefore builds potential energy. So, should this matter to you? Uh, for your health? Well, yeah, hell yes. <laughs> water matters, and light matters, right? And so, for your own health, um, what 
you need to make sure that you have an adequate amount of EZ in your cells. This is the same as hydration. You know, if you're dehydrated, you won't function. So you need to maintain, and I, I'm going to give you um, six different approaches to how you can do this to maintain your health, very simple ways. And the first way is obvious. I drink a lot of water because water is the raw material for building easy water. <coughs> and the next one is green juicing. I think some of you are familiar with that. You know, you take the leaves, you squeeze them, and you drink the stuff, and, and it's reported that all kinds of positive health effects come from drinking this stuff. I, uh, I've spoken with various, various health providers, and it's confirmed by every one of them. Why does it work? It's possible that it works because, yeah, five minutes, thank you. <laughs> I'll speak, I'll skip every other word. Uh, it's possible that it works because you're squeezing the water from inside the cell. And the plant cells have just the same easy water as our cells. So you're squeezing out this easy water and you're drinking this good stuff, which then replaces what's missing uh, in, in your cell to begin with. There are certain substances that also help. I, I've listed three of them. We've studied seven or eight, turmeric, coconut water, ghee. All of these are known throughout the millennia to be good for health. It almost doesn't matter what ails you, these, these will help. So we had the idea, maybe they help because maybe, hypothesis, they build easy water. So we did the experiments, we just published it. Every one of these builds easy water. And by the way, glyphosate does the opposite. Uh, so the effects of glyphosate might reside in dehydration, even at very low concentrations. Sunshine in Seattle, you know, we don't see the sun too often in the winter. When the sun comes out, we feel great. Why is that? Well, it might be a psychological effect. It also might be that the light coming from the sun builds easy water wherever it's missing in our body. And so if we're feeling depressed, we walk outside, the sun is shining, we feel better. An extreme example of that is the sauna, right? It's infrared energy, heat. And you go into a sauna, you feel rotten, and 20 minutes later, you feel great. I've had the experience quite a few times. Uh, well, sometimes. And I think it's possible that it's so simple that it could simply be that the infrared energy being absorbed by your entire body uh, is building easy water where the easy water is missing. Uh, and finally, there's some more, but earthing. You know, the earth is negatively charged. Uh, some of you, I don't know that, but maybe not everybody, but the evidence is very clear, except most of us, many of us don't know about it. I, myself, starting in electrical engineering, never heard such a thing. You could have knocked me over with a feather if you told me that the earth was negatively charged. It seems true. If you connect yourself to this negative charge, taking off your, uh, your socks, the negative charge will seep into your body and if, if you want to convert water to easy water, you need negative charge. And so this negative charge is provided by the earth. And therefore, connect yourself to the earth and feel better. So I'm not suggesting that we photosynthesize, but I am suggesting um, that we use light in much the same way as plants use light. So we're not so different from the plants. Uh, practical applications in my three minutes, I think I... I have, uh, well, this is negative, this is positive. You put an electrode here and here, you ought to be able to light a light bulb. And uh, we've done it. Uh, I won't go through the details of what you see here, but whoops. But, but uh, uh, if you turn the switch, there's water there, you get light from water, simply from water and solar energy. You don't need to deplete the earth of its valuable resources. So there's one application. We actually formed a company um, to develop some of these applications. And um, the second one is getting drinking water from contaminated water. So you put the water in this way with all the junk in it. And as representative junk, we use microspheres. So you know the microspheres gather here, and you have an exclusion zone here and here. So we build a, a device into which this water flows and the central chamber here collects all the junk and dumps it. You can see the representative junk here and if you connect the water from here it's clear and you can see 
and we've gotten a 200 to 1 separation in a single pass. We're trying to scale this up for practical use. We think we may be able to separate salt this way, and if so, uh, we'll be able to take ocean water, separate the salt, using only the energy from the sun. No, no other energy. Okay, so conclusions. Uh, the first is that our evidence shows that there are four phases of water, not three. And I put the easy right here because we have evidence uh, published and also in, in my recent book. If you want to go from water to ice, you must necessarily pass through this phase. And if you melt the ice uh, to water, you must necessarily go through this phase. Um, so, and the implications of all of this stuff, I think, are really broad. Uh, the main central point is that you have radiant energy that is being absorbed by the water all the time. There are biological implications. I think not only blood vessels, but all of your cells are using this radiant energy, uh, just in, in a way maybe similar to the way whoops, plants do. Uh, in chemistry, you read a chemistry book, they'll never talk about charge separation. They'll never talk about the influence of light. If what I presented to you is correct, and you never know, um, many of the interpretations in the basic chemistry book will need to be revised. Weather. You never know uh, if you need to bring an umbrella to work or not. 50% chance of rain, you know how it goes. And I think one of the reasons is that the uh, atmospheric scientists think weather in terms of temperature and pressure. I think it's charge that's more important than uh, temperature and, and pressure. And um, I, I believe in the next few years it will be demonstrated that if you take into account the charge, you can explain many of the basic features of weather of all sort. For health, well, you know, you need, you need water, you need easy water which, which fills our cells. And for food, it's kind of obvious, it's got, <laughs> food's got water and you really need to know something about the water in, in, in order to fully understand about uh, about the food, and for practical applications, there is filtration, desalination, electricity. And uh, the next to final slide is something that is not related at all um, to what I presented, but I, it's, uh, I wanna present it, or just say, it's called the Institute for Venture Science. And this institute funds promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking and may bring scientific revolutions, of which there have been very few, lots of technological revolutions, but not fundamental science in the past decades. We're trying to restore that. Uh, we've invited pre-proposals. We got more than 200. We picked 15, and out of that uh, full proposals, we got 12, and we selected five very exciting projects. We're now looking for donors. So if any of this stuff is interesting for you, um, please check out this book, uh, available from Amazon. We were supposed to have some here, but it somehow never worked out. I invite you, there's great art done by my son. So maybe it's the text may be not so interesting, but the pictures are worth it. And it's cheap. <laughs> Thank you very much.